while I've had a few close calls, as many women do, this one still haunts me as I'm usually hypervigilant. But I came up against a pro. This happened about 12 years ago. We were living in a rental house in a quaint village in Southern California. While it was in a residential neighborhood, it was a few blocks away from the downtown village area. The area was filled with shops, restaurants, and bars, along with an active trolley station not far from a state college. Old Hollywood. There was always activity going on as our street was a cut through to the action. People coming and going, especially college kids, even ringing our doorbell, was not unusual. I was in the habit of jogging at night, but only with my German Shepherd slash Rottweiler named Bear. He was an intimidating looking dog, although well trained. A former police dog and rescue, he had settled in well to domestic life. He was very friendly unless you either gave him a reason not to be, or he sensed something about you that was off. He could not stand my ex-husband for example, but he loved my current husband. So he was an amazing judge of character. His instincts were always dead on. Any attention I got after sundown jogging was almost always discouraged once they saw Bear, and wisely so. One night as I ran past the trolley station, a young, goofy guy sporting a beanie, and a lope, and who obviously never ran further than up to his weed dealer, tried to keep up with us while we ran. He kept asking where I lived and if he could come over and give me a kiss. It was a bit comical so I firmly yelled for him to back off, and Bear dissuaded him by a short showing of teeth and a growl as we ran. Nuff said. We never even broke stride. When I got home I told my husband. He scowled and suggested I check out the sex offender website and see if the guy was on there. The loping wannabe lover was not there. But I recognized someone I did have an experience with. I genuinely felt a chill run across the hair on my arms and up the back of my neck. It was the ficus plant guy who had stopped by the house a few days before. The ficus plant guy was an older Hispanic man, tall and thin, dressed in a filthy gray work jumper with the name tag torn off, gray slash white beard to match his jumper, and gray slash greasy unkempt longish hair. Wizened, with leather skin and a hound dog expression, every deep wrinkle on his face, of which there were many, or testament to an unpleasant life entrenched in misery. This was December of that year, drizzling early morning and my husband had just left for work. Our house was set back slightly, but still visible from the street. There was an unlocked gate across the driveway about 10 feet from the back kitchen door. The kitchen door had a large, glass pane and next to it was a large kitchen window that ran nearly the length of the wall. It was bright and airy. I could clearly see out to the street and any passerby could see into our kitchen especially past the gate. I was in the living room out of sight having just poured my first cup of hot coffee. Bear was curled up in his bed by the fireplace, in full view of the kitchen window and door. Think Norman Rockwell. I heard the rattle of the kitchen door. I assumed my husband had come back, but wasn't able to get in for some reason. So I wasn't alarmed, at first. But Bear seemed to be. I wondered why my husband didn't use his key. I realized that whoever was at the kitchen door chose to avoid the front door with the bell and had let themselves into and past the closed gate. Having done so, they could easily access the backyard and the open French doors where I was sitting. Who would do that? So I quickly got up to investigate. As I made my way to the door, I was surprised to see Ficus plant guy, we will call him John. He cut a sorrowful, yet imposing figure pressed against our door peering in through cupped hands. Bear had sprung to his feet at this point and ran into the kitchen getting to the door before I got there. He was barking and growling menacingly. Incredulously, I spoke through the glass to John, now feeling my spidey senses kick in because Bear would not back down. So I chose not to not open the door, at first. Instead, I asked John through the glass a haughty, can I help you? Manifesting Eeyore, he asked if we had a ficus plant in our backyard. Thrown off, at the time. I didn't even know what a ficus plant looked like. I told him, no, uh, I don't think so. There were no plants back there that weren't in the ground, and it was all very typical SoCal flora or palm trees. I was a little put off by the temerity of someone coming into our yard, past our gate, and jiggling our kitchen door as he did and, initially, my demeanor was more terse and guarded. And try as I may I could not get Bear to stop bark growling, which was irritating me. But I returned Bear's unusual display of disobedience with annoyance and commands to be quiet, instead of paying attention to what it really meant. My bad. John was unaffected by my vicious beast or my tone. John persisted. His pursuit of the ficus plant was as determined as it was touching. The plant, it seemed, belonged to his dying mother who, he claimed, had lived in this house once. 
She had left it behind, but it meant a lot to her and he was hoping he could retrieve it for her. I told him again there was no ficus plant in the backyard that I was aware of. Is it potted or hanging? He didn't know. Is it a mature plant? He couldn't say. Does it flower? He was losing patience. He just wanted me to either let him in, or give him permission to explore the back. Eventually I began to feel sorry for John as he cut a sorrowful figure, and I didn't want to appear callous or prejudiced because of his ethnicity or disheveled state. So I went to open the door. In a fury never seen before nor again, my black and tan ninety pounds dog threw himself, threw himself, at the door knob, knocking my hand away and me off balance. Bear! I shouted. Down! Be quiet! He would have none of it. Ignoring me he barked like he was a German POW guard dog spotting runners at the wall. Showing teeth and snarling, I once again moved Bear aside and told him to go to his place. Indignant and growling he slowly edged toward his bed, backward, never taking his eyes off John. I apologized and tried to get more information from him, sincerely wanting to help this sad specimen of humanity before me, but it was hard to hear him through the glass. So once again I went to open the door, he had pulled the screen door open. He no longer seemed a threat to me, more an object of pity. As I went to unlock the door and grasp the handle again, from behind me came a rolling, running, menacing ball of canine fury and hate charging like a hound from hell toward fresh meat. Mongrel barks shot out in a cacophony of rapid succession, with snarling snorting teeth bare knock my hand away and me to the floor. He threw himself against the glass barking and snapping at John through it, sure to tear him to shreds but for the few inches of tempered glass between them. I was shocked, furious, and apologetic all at once. John was unfazed, completely ignoring the beast before him. I was as much unnerved by John's reaction as I was by Bear's focused fury. I thought maybe I shouldn't open the door, you think? Once I got Bear to a low roar, I suggested that John give me his name and phone number and I would ask my landlord if such a plant had ever existed. If so I would call him and make arrangements for him to pick it up. While my hellhound did not dissuade him my request for his name and number did. No, no, nope, he muttered, shaking his head as he made his way down the steps and out the gate. It's okay, I don't mind. I responded. He said something in Spanish as he limped with the getty up across the lawn and down the street to his vehicle. A van. A blue, roughly hand-painted with the kitchen broom van. An old U-Haul with a blacked-out passenger window. Then and only then did Bear stop his tirade and jauntily jotted back to his bed, tail up with an air of mission accomplished about him. What the hell just happened? I muttered to myself. Oh well, damn my coffee was cold. So imagine my surprise when a week later when looking for loping wannabe lover on the sex offender website, I happened across John. He had an unmistakable, unforgettable face and demeanor. And we had done the back and forth dance for about 15 minutes, so I got a good look. He was a convicted sex offender. A sexual predator. In fact, Multiple arrests for talking his way into homes, no forced entry, where a woman was home alone, tying them up, and raping them, brutalizing them repeatedly with foreign objects, sodomizing them, torturing them, in various ways, four hours. As of that moment the police had no idea where he was, but his last known location was the village where I lived. But for my sweet, loyal, fearless and fearsome very, very good German shepherd slash Roddy, bear dog. I would have gotten to know John much, much better that day. I'm guessing there was no ficus plant. And no, let's not meet. Ever. This may be a ramble of thoughts but after recently stumbling on this sub I finally felt a place I could offer something that my family and I experienced a few years ago that to this day gives me a shiver. I have been camping, solo backpacking and hunting my whole life in Oregon, and felt comfortable in the woods and have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago my wife, daughter, and two German shepherds went camping north of empty Jefferson, Oregon. I have included the coordinates of our campsite which we found to be the perfect setup for us and our two dogs who need privacy since they are intimidating to other dog owners and can be loud when spooked. It was not an established campsite, just a nice horseshoe off a USFS road that had flat ground full trees, and a fire pit. The first night my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent right next to ours, was maybe two feet away from me and my wife's tent. We made the male German Shepherd sleep, Guts is his name, with her in the tent. That whole first night neither my wife and I could sleep. We both heard footsteps and they were heavy, not like typical forest critters scampering around the night. 
I was well armed because I was paranoid from reading recently before departing about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his two infant daughters. Needless to say both my wife and I had two pistols and my rifle with me. The dogs are great at detection and that is why I felt my daughter could sleep alone because Guts is completely fearless and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night which I ultimately decided was deer or maybe some elk. Day 2. Morning. We go for a walk down the road and maybe 300 feet away see the circle area in the photo. I see an abandoned road where a rusted gate post, gate was missing, was covered in vegetation. Something of blue color caught my eye and Guts immediately took off running down this abandoned road. My heart began to race because I thought it was another family camping like us and he was going to get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death so I chased after him as fast as I could and the rest followed. He stops after 20 feet into the road and me yelling his name but I have covered just enough distance to see that there is nobody there and something is off about the sight. I yell, hello is anyone there, sorry about the dog. I got no response. My curiosity gets the best of me and I have to see what the site conditions are. As I got closer I knew something was wrong, it had all the necessities for a campsite including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets, folding table but every single item had been completely destroyed, smashed and torn from what appeared to be claw marks. We all walked around in circles puzzled why anyone would leave all their camping gear behind including an expensive REI tent. I figured well someone left in a hurry and animals got to the rest as the only logical explanation. Still a propane tank and cooler were flattened by something and it certainly wasn't snow packed with tree coverage in that spot. As the afternoon rolls in, me and my daughter are playing bocce ball at the campsite and my wife is walking maybe 70 foot north to do her business. I do not have direct line of sight on her but all of a sudden I see Guts make a mad dash straight towards her. Normally he would always be with me unless he was called over and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention and I knew something weird was happening, so I ran over there and my wife started jogging at me and I immediately drew my pistol. Guts had completely continued running into the forest another 100 feet before I called him and he stopped. My other dog Leah who never misses the opportunity to be the pack leader is not taking points. I have had her for 7 years now and this was the first time in her life she refused to leave my daughter's side. She was fully raised and attached to us at the hip. Again anytime we hike or play Leah is up front bossing everything in her path and pauses to look to see where we are and continues. I asked my wife what happened and she said, I was trying to pee and all of a sudden I felt all my hairs rise. I know someone was watching me, and then I saw Guts running towards me and I just got up to move towards you. We spent 10 minutes looking for signs of anything and saw no trails, broken branches, nothing to point to what and where something went. We decide we are spending one more night since it's too late to pack up and drive but we will all be in the big tent together. Before we go to bed I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of our campsite. I used a mint can and some coins and keys from our truck and zip tied it so anything hitting the rope gave a little jingle. Very unsophisticated but it put my wife at ease. As I go to tie my last corner off at a tree near our tent our third mystery item unveils itself. It looks like someone has done the same exact thing I have done with a rope that was so old and brown I didn't see it at first. It was broken and only a few pieces remained but sure enough it was tied at roughly the same height 8-10 and off the ground and even had a few rusted washers on it. I immediately felt someone has stayed here before and put the same makeshift warning system on the same tree I am maybe 10 to 15 years ago based on the condition of the rope. Perhaps my paranoia has now reached a new height but I had to make sure the girls felt we are safe and at the time the only thing I could think of was when the evening came around I made them sit in the truck and I fired a clip of my .45 into the dirt as a signal to whatever was out there that we are armed. I reassured the girls that anybody listening to that now knows we have two wolves and are armed and we are too risky of a target so we can sleep safely. That night we heard no footsteps and the dogs never perked up and barked, we left early the next morning. Fast forward to today and I watched the Amazon Missing 4 1100 documentary and I noticed the cluster smack dab close to where we camped that weekend and a flood of dread rushes me as I think of that mysterious abandoned campsite with the ripped tent and smashed cooler and cooktop. We have been camping since and have enjoyed the beauty of the NW but there was something there at that place that possibly took or harmed someone else less than 300 feet away from where we camped and we all thank our lucky stars Guts was doing his thing so well that afternoon. A couple years ago, 
one of my closest friends relocated cross-country with his long-term girlfriend to work a job he couldn't refuse. Only issue he had was that he did not want to fly his dogs out with him when they made the move since they'd be staying in a hotel for the first month. He was also a bit reluctant to fly them out due to health concerns for both pets. By the time he located a home to rent, he was missing his furry buddies and made the request of his sister, another close friend, and myself to drive them to him in LA. Now we are Chicago folks, so the trip would be a long one, however, with the three of us to foot the near 30-hour drive, it would be a piece of cake. We left early and drove long hours. Along the way, it was decided between my friend and I that we'd foot the majority of the drive ourselves and if we needed to, we'd let our friend's sister do some driving. We were in a bit of a time crunch due to a snafu with the rental agreement, so we didn't have the luxury to stop very often past an 8-hour stay at a Denver La Quinta Inn. As for the journey itself, it was relatively smooth, barring getting pulled over right before entering Utah for driving for two miles in the left lane of an empty highway. Whoops. From that point we made it through Utah, Arizona, and Nevada without much trouble until we entered California in need of gas. I had been driving for the majority of the first day and tagged my buddy in after being pulled over. I remained in the shotgun seat as navigator, searching through the GPS for a fuel stop. We kept our eyes peeled for road signs and discovered a sign pointing to Yermo Ghost Town, or something along those lines, which had a mobile station. How wonderful. It was convenient, too, as it was located almost directly off of the interstate. We rolled in on a little more than fumes when we approached the pumps. Normally we let the dogs out at every rest stop, but having stopped not long before then and with both dogs sleeping snugly in the back, I decided to pump gas without anyone else leaving the vehicle. My buddy pulled us up on the opposite side of a beat-up green sedan with a short, plump gentleman who just turned in to approach the shop. I noticed a few other hoop ties at the pumps, all unoccupied, and there were a couple of other cars parked up near the station, most likely belonging to the employees, so nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Until I swiped my credit card. The pump rejected my first swipe attempt, which I chalked up to a misread. I swiped again and the pump read out, please see attendant. I was annoyed but we needed gas. I tapped on the window and told my buddy what I was doing and asked if anyone needed anything. After taking their orders for Gatorade and Marlboro Reds, I walked up to the store and made a mental note of how strange this gas station was. Kind of quiet, especially for one ride off the interstate, but that's no matter. As I walked in though, more weirdness. First thing I notice is that there are some boxes of chips just left on the floor, like someone was stocking shelves and just quit. As I veered to my right, I noticed that immediately there is no one milling about in this place. With the six cars besides my own out there, I felt like I would see someone. Things got even weirder when I realized that there was no one behind the counter. No customers or workers. And then it dawned on me, what had happened to the gentleman who was at the pump adjacent to mine. Surely they can't all be in the bathroom. This is where I began to feel this gnawing sensation in my stomach. Something isn't right. I have always been a person who felt like I could trust my instincts, and those instincts were screaming at me to just get the hell out. I want to run, but I hold back. I would look suspicious booking it out of a gas station that was empty and decide to just play it cool. Natural. Don't let your body language let on to how badly you're freaking out in your head. I was probably inside of this gas station for only a couple of minutes when I left, but I stopped just before exiting to listen for something. Anything. A flushing toilet would have been a good sound, but nothing. As I exit the shop and see my car, I begin to feel dread. It's like that moment in a movie where the hero is about to make it to the end of their trial, but the celebratory fanfare disappears and in that silence, something comes and strikes them down. I was about 25 yards from the car when I saw this gentleman come out from around the side of the shop opposite of me. This is not the same man as I saw while pumping gas. He was larger and had a peculiar look on his face. The best way I could describe it was like Nick Cage's smile from face slash off, before the titular act had occurred. I continued walking towards my car, but when I turned back to look at him, he was now walking towards me with a purpose. At this point I noped my way back to the car with increased urgency in my step. And of course my friend has the door to the car locked like a complete douche clown. There is also the 95 pounds golden retriever sitting in my seat. Apparently my travel companions did not notice how freaked out I was, or the creepy gentleman still walking in my direction. I punched the window and told him to unlock the freaking door to which he only half rolls down the window to tell me the dog was in my seat and they were afraid she'd jump out when I opened the door. 
I reached my hand in and threw the dog towards the back seat as hard as I could while my friend is just now realizing how freaked out I am. He started the car and drove off quickly. I took one last look back and saw Nick Cage had stopped about a pump away from where we were still with that same look on his face. We found another gas station further down the road, this time with a ton of people inside and out. After thoroughly creeping out my friends with the story as I pumped gas, we made our way back to the interstate, which meant passing that gas station again. It's been about 15 minutes since we pulled out initially, and we go silent as we notice that those very same cars are still sitting in the same spots where we had left them. After thoroughly freaking out for a few miles, I received a phone call from my credit card company about a $100 charge at mobile station. The lady on the phone was really helpful in fixing the situation for me and was as entirely creeped out by the situation as we were. In the end, we made it to LA and had a great vacation, but it still bothers me as to what the hell was going on at this little gas station off the highway and what the hell was that smiling man's story. So, crazy smiling man and whoever else was lying in wait at the Yermo Ghost Town exit mobile station, let's not meet. This happened last Sunday and I'm still as mad as a cow with its foot stuck in the mud. Me and my older brother, we'll call Lance, were taking our younger siblings to church on Sunday, and we decided to take the longer way to enjoy some more time of music in my mama's car with ridiculously good speakers. Anyway, I was already not in the most churchy mood that morning cause I wanted to drive my truck but I digress. So we were going down the road just cruising when we came up to a car going around 60 in a 65. No biggie, Lance started to go around. Keep in mind this is an extremely desolate road, and we had not seen any other cats but this one so far. We were about a two Suburbans length back from the car when Lance started to pass. As soon as we got right beside the car it swerved almost right into us. This lunatic was trying to run us off the road, so naturally Lance floored it to get past. When we did pass the car sped up right behind our bumper riding our tail so darn close and you could see their jaws jacking away in their car screaming. We were so confused, and had no clue why they swerved. And I remember after laughing and saying, it would be ironic if they went to church, I just couldn't keep my thoughts to myself. The car followed us all the way to town. The town that I ain't gonna disclose is very small. We have a donut shop, parts store, 7 to 11, and a burger place. Well Lance took a sharp turn to go through town to see if they'd follow and sure enough, follow us right into 7-Elevens. As soon as they pulled up next to us we realized it's one of the women that sat in front of us in church. She pulls up and screams, oh it's you. And either me or Lance says, what are you doing trying to run us into the ditch? Then she went off screaming, mf this mf that. Then she screamed, there are kids in the car. What the heck were you thinking? You really want to run us off the road. And I can't believe with her knowing us and being a Christian woman screams, I will run this whole mf in the ditch. That's when I went off. You ain't gonna threaten my little brothers and sisters like that. I don't care who you are. I started screaming back at her that I don't even remember the things I said. But not once in the whole screaming match did I cuss at that woman and she was throwing out F this and EFF that to the world. Then I unbuckled my seatbelt cause she kept acting like she's gonna get out. So now it is probably the time to say that I'm a 17 year old 5 feet 7 inches girl and I ain't small. And if this woman wants to be tough stuff then I show her something to be tough about. We didn't end up getting out cause no matter how much she screamed, get yo daddy, I take him down too. Which you okay lady, have your tantrum. The last thing I remember screaming at her was, you're a pathetic excuse for an adult. That's when she got mad and floored it. She was at the entrance of the 7-Eleven still screaming, get yo daddy. Ugh, naive women. Lance just kept saying very calmly, we're about to go to church. Is this how Christians act? That got her butt flap wrinkled and she took off. You'd think that'd be all. But remember we still gotta go to church with this woman. We get to church and we're waiting outside cause it ain't started yet and Lance goes over to her to calmly talk to her. I didn't go over there cause I was the one screaming at her so I didn't think that was a good idea. So everything said here is from Lance. Ma'am I'm over here to calmly talk this out with you. No. I'm the adult here. Listen. Okay. Talk then, Lance said. I don't remember what she said but she started to raise her voice and yell at him again so he said, you really gonna yell and make a fool of yourself at church. Go ahead. I was around 15 feet away and I could see her purse her lips and ball her fists. She says, you're a child. I'm not a child, 
I'm 19 years old and acting way more like an adult than you are. And credit to Lance cause he definitely was. Then she tells him again, get your daddy. I put him in the dirt and jack your jaw. Keep in mind Lance is 5'11 and 210, a very stocky boy and my daddy's 6 feet and 230 something. Now cue my dad walking up to me. I tell him that Jenna's mama tried to run us off the road and now yelling at Bubba. I could see him get all tough. You can tell when he takes big steps and rearranges his shoulders. He walks over there and she immediately takes a chill pill. Daddy asks what's going on and she goes, well your son passed me in a no passing zone. And I swear to them. The way she said it like it was no big deal is baffling. My dad has grown up here all his life so he goes where? She tells him and he says that's a passing zone. And even if it ain't you're gonna swerve at them? She goes yup. Then she starts calling my brother a child and says she doesn't care if she swerved that she was right to do so. That's when Lance goes okay I ain't talking to you no more. And they walk back over to us. Seriously, every person I ever met this woman is the most childish and psychotic. She's a member of our church and her admitting she tried running a vehicle full of children off the road and proud of it makes me furious. And she also had her daughter in the car with her and she was mortified her mama did that you could see it on her face. I've road raged but never gotten into this much of a confrontation with someone over the road. This is it for now, but I'll update if there's any more to the story. Thank y'all and watch out for crazy Baptists road raging women. Okay so bear with me. This happened when I was a kid and I double checked the story with my family. So this was in the mid 80s. I was about 7 at home with 2 of my older sisters, 8 and 11ish, and 2 cousins, 7 and 8ish. All 5 girls. My sister, 11, was in charge of babysitting us 4 younger girls. You have to picture what our house looked like to understand what happened. It was a 2 story box house with a flat roof and a small box front porch, also with a flat roof. I can't remember what we were doing but we were all in the house. We kept hearing noises coming from the roof like walking and what sounded like rocks being dropped down the downspouts. You know kids, we thought of a squirrel or something. But it kept happening. Then my older sister said something about how maybe someone climbed the huge tree beside the house and got on the roof. We were all scared because we knew there was a roof access point in the bedroom that I shared with one of my sisters. What if he could get inside? My oldest sister told my other sister and one of our cousins to walk across the street to the corner store, across an empty gravel parking lot, and on the way back, look up and see if they could see someone on the roof. So the girls, both about eight years old, walked one halfway across the parking lot and being curious kids, turned around, looked up and saw a guy in one of those totally 80s guys crop top football jerseys, think Johnny Depp in A Nightmare on Elm Street. He was couched down on the roof. The girls came running home freaking out and told my older sister about the guy. My older sister, freaking out, first went to the neighbor's house to use their deck to see if she could see on our roof but couldn't see anything. She came home and then called the police. It felt like it took them ages to show up. When they got there, I don't think they believed a word we said. They thought a bunch of little kids were making up this story for attention. One cop drove down the road, up a hill about a block away, to see if they could see anything but the way the roof was you couldn't see a person if they were lay. Then these cops tell us kids that we had to go upstairs and check everywhere to see if we found anyone. Five little girls from ages 7 to 11 went upstairs, scared crapless, cry, to look for this man, knowing about the roof access. We all cried not wanting to go but they said we had to. To this day I remember how scared I was. I remember looking but how well do little kids look right? The cops didn't listen to us, didn't check out the house, inside or out and left. We were so scared to be left home with the guy out there, who knows where. We didn't know if he was just laying down on the roof or jumped down or somehow got in and was hiding. My mom finally got home a few hours later and we told her what happened and my mom explained to us that there was a lock on the roof access and no one could get in but she checked anyway. Then went to check out the outside. There were clear footprints in the dirt, dug and well from him jumping off the roof, onto the porch and off into the flower bed. Oh my mom was so steaming mad when she realized we told the truth and weren't believed by the police. We went to the police station the next day and we were all separated and interviewed. We all told the same story. My mom went up one side of the cops and down the other. We never found out who the guy was or why he was there. Did he know it was a house with five little girls home alone? 
This was in the mid-2000s when I was in about second or third grade. I lived in the rural Midwest and went to a decently sized elementary school. For a few weeks, a friend of mine I chatted with often was absent from school. I was confused and curious as to why he hadn't been attending school for so many days. Soon, I found out from other kids at the school that he was taking time to rest and recover after a very traumatic experience in his family. I'm not going to reveal names as for one, I do not remember the boy's name and I don't want to reveal any personal info about those whose names I do remember. For the sake of easier reading, I will call the boy who was absent Mike. The standard chats and occasional gossip I'd share with friends on the playground and in the cafeteria took a very dark turn once word got out of why Mike was absent. One day, a friend of mine, let's call him, Chad, told us that Mike's mother was murdered. Hearing later from some of the school employees and my own parents, I found out that this horrific act was carried out by the boyfriend of Mike's sister. The killer had snuck into the bedroom of his girlfriend's mother. He then either stabbed her to death or slit her throat in her sleep. I don't remember the exact details. I was only around 9 or 10 years old, so hearing this was especially shocking. Having something like that happen so close to me, even more so. I'm not quite sure how reliable this is, but according to Chad, the mother didn't want her daughter's relationship to get sexual until she and her boyfriend were married. She also didn't want them to get married until they had been together for a few years and she had gotten to know the guy well enough to know that he would treat her daughter well. The sister's boyfriend was furious at this, and believed that the best way to get what he wanted would be to eliminate what he saw as a roadblock. I was disgusted and disturbed at such a selfish, pathetic, and creepy motive. This so-called man murdered an innocent woman just because he wanted to have sex with her daughter, and was delusional enough to believe that she would go along with him after he carried out the gruesome act. I remember one day on the way back home from school, my mom pointed out that the funeral procession was happening around the neighborhood we lived in. It honestly surprised me that it was that close to where we live. I remember seeing Mike in his black suit and tie, with a very somber and serious look on his face. At school I remember him being a pretty easygoing, cheerful guy who enjoyed cracking jokes with me. Seeing him like this hurt and I can only imagine how this terror has affected him. Horror like this seems like it would stay with you. But honestly, I only just now remembered it, and there's still so many details that I don't quite recall. I don't even remember if Mike ever came back to school for the rest of the semester or not. If he did, I have no idea what I would have even said to him. What the hell do you even say to someone who has just had their life so cruelly changed at a young age? What do you say to someone whose mother was just taken from them by some heartless monster? Something about my memory of this being hazy unnerves me, and I wonder if being hit with this cold reality at such a young age influenced my often cynical outlook on the world. I hope Mike and his family are doing well, because no one deserves to go through that. This isn't something that I talk about much. You can believe it or think I'm making things up. I don't care. I just feel that I had to get this out. A little backstory before I begin. This story takes place just outside of Baltimore, Maryland in a place called Fort Armistead. It was an Army Coastal Defense Fort from 1901 to 1920 and was abandoned in 1923. It was later turned into a Baltimore City Park. You can easily Google the history for more info. Honestly, it's a pretty shady area, but it's right on the water and has some beautiful views. The abandoned fort is still there, but it is now covered with graffiti from top to bottom. With the ruins also being surrounded by trees, it makes for some beautiful scenery. I'll try and explain the layout as best I can. It's important. You park on the side and walk up the dirt path to an opening in the trees. The ruins are to your left when you enter, and it runs long ways along the left side. The right side drops down a hill into trees with the path, but there are stairs periodically that will bring you down to the bottom level of the ruins to that path that leads to the bunker tunnels. So the actual top part of the fort is two parts, and then there's the part down the hill with the path that runs along the front of the fort. The top portion had the main drag where most of the artwork is. You can also look down old chutes into the bunkers below. The top part of the fort is the best part, scenery-wise. And the only way to access the top of the fort is by staircases on each end of the ruins. The stairs closest to the entrance are basically non-existent, so one has to walk all the way across the fort to reach the other set of stairs at the other end. They were in better shape. Once you're up at the top, it's nothing but trees and the water in our line. But if you look down, you can clearly see the bottom dirt path down by the bunkers. 
the top part is completely flat concrete and juts out in places over towards the trees. A really nice area to just enjoy the views and chill. I moved to Maryland from Connecticut a couple years ago. My sister Katie still lived in CT, but she would come visit me from time to time. I have been to Fort Armistead before and even explored the bunkers. Not much down there but still fun to explore. I loved the upper part of the ruins and wanted to show Katie while she was visiting that summer. So, one afternoon we decided to go up and she could see the fort. We got in my car and I drove us up the bumpy, car-destroying road that leads to the park. I parked up on the side of the road next to the entrance to the fort ruins, and we headed up the short dirt path that led to the entrance. Now, I'm naturally extremely protective of my baby sister, so when I noticed this guy, I was immediately on guard. He was in his forties, kinda disheveled, but he didn't look homeless. I don't remember much about his looks, though. He was full on staring at us, and I was trying not to obviously stare, but I knew I had to keep my eye on him. I turned to Katie who was completely oblivious and I decided to not say anything. She was enjoying all the artwork and the trees and the cool concrete ruins around us. I didn't want to ruin our experience over a weird feeling. We continued up the front to the ruins since the steps closest to us didn't exist anymore. As we were walking, we came across another guy. Also in his forties. He was just leaning up against the ruins watching us, too. We walked past him, Katie still oblivious. Me even more on guard. That hair-raising fear started to creep in, but I pushed it away. I didn't want to ruin this time with my sister. So we pressed on. We get to the stairs, and this is where things get creepy for me. We climb the stairs and get up to the top. I took a minute to enjoy the time with my sister until I got a bad feeling. I look down and see the guy from the entrance speed walking down the path down by the bunkers and into the woods at the end of the path, still watching us the whole time. My mind went into panic mode. I had been there enough times to know that the path down by the bunkers loops around in the trees and completely bypasses the lower level to the ruins and leads straight up to where we were. There was only one set of steps but that meant we had to go towards where the guy would soon emerge from. The only other option was a 15 plus foot drop down onto concrete, or a smaller drop all the way on the other side where the old stairs were. I made a split decision and told Katie that we had to go, now. We ran down those awkward sized and half broken concrete steps and basically ran back towards the entrance. The second guy moved and was down closer by the entrance. I just hurried my sister along past him, hoping he wouldn't try anything. I didn't look back until I unlocked my car. As Katie climbed in, I opened my door and looked back before climbing in myself. Any thought that I had had about just being paranoid or making something out of nothing quickly melted away as I looked over and saw the first man standing partially hidden by trees in the entrance, just staring at me with cold, angry eyes. He had chased us back. That realization was enough for me to jump in the car and just get out as fast as I could. Katie was still pretty confused especially since she knew nothing of what was happening until I said we had to go. I basically told her someone was following us and that we needed to leave. I explained more in the car as we were driving away. She was unsurprisingly horrified. I don't blame her. I was, too. That was the first and only time in my life that I felt that kind of fear. But even with realizing what was happening, my first instinct was to protect my sister and just get out of there. I'm still kicking myself for leaving my safety keychain hanging off my shifter. It had pepper spray on it, but I'm thankful we weren't put in a position where I had to actually use it. I still wonder what I saved us from that day. What that man's intentions were. I shudder thinking about it. I try to store the whole thing away, but the thought somehow creeps into my mind on an almost daily basis. I'm just glad Katie is safe. Hell, I'm glad I'm safe. I haven't been back to Fort Armistead since. When I bring it up, Katie says that while it was really creepy, it was still a beautiful place.